Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bethel this morning. Uh, would you stand and join us as we begin? It's good to have you with us as we have come today to worship. You know, during Christmas season, it's great to worship Jesus as the newborn king, but we continue to worship him every day of our lives, and it is great to have you here today. Hopefully, you received a worship folder on the way in. Uh, this week, we were using up some leftover bulletin stock, so your picture on yours might look a little bit different than the person beside you. That's okay. The same content is inside there. Uh, I want to point out to you there are some Bible reading plans uh, on the back table there by the offering box. And uh, two different colors, one's just a, a larger print than the others. But if you'd like to try to read through the Bible this year, uh, there are some guides that can help you, and each day has a suggested reading, and you can check it off as you go. 
And that's just an, an aid to assist you as you try to faithfully handle God's Word together. One of the joys we have as a, uh, a, a family of brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ is remembering our great salvation provided for us by the Lord Jesus Christ who came and he lived among us and he died for us. He died in our place, taking our sins upon himself. And so we take the uh, practice of communion, we take the bread and the juice and we remember the body and blood of Jesus that was given for us. Here at Bethel, we celebrate communion on the first Sundays of the month, and today is the first Sunday of the new year. You can tell people I haven't missed church uh, a single Sunday this year. Uh, you've been here every Sunday this year. Uh, but today is the first Sunday, and so we take communion together. We read in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes and says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, what a delight it is today to know the truth of Scripture that you have provided a way for us to have our sins forgiven, a way for us to be reconciled to you, and our hope is spending eternity with you forever. And today as we take communion, may we remember anew and afresh just what a costly gift our salvation was. That Jesus gave himself and was nailed to the cross, suffered and died, taking our sin upon himself so that we might be forgiven. And may, uh, may we remember and may our hearts be moved with thankfulness and gratitude for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. It's in the end of your Bible, toward, uh, toward the end, right after the books of First and Second Timothy, it's before Philemon and Hebrews. It's a short book. It's one that we often don't spend a whole lot of time uh, in. But if you're having a little bit of difficulty finding it, we're not going to get there right away, so we'll get there in a little bit, so you have time to find it. But I uh, hope you will bring your Bibles with you on Sundays when you come, uh, whether it be uh, an actual book or if you're on your phone or iPad or whatever form, but the Word of God is what is truly important. My words, not important. God's Word is what is truth. And uh, there are so many false teachers, smooth talkers who sound so good, but they lead so many astray because they're not teaching the truth. How do you identify them? By studying the Word of God. Paul talks in the book of Acts about the Bereans, 
who would listen to Paul preach, and then they'd go home and check it out in their Bible to see if he was telling them the truth. So always feel free to do that with me. You hear me say something on a Sunday morning, check it out in the Bible. Because what I say isn't important. What God says is what's truly important. I hope you had a uh, wonderful Christmas and New Year's celebration. I always like to take a week of vacation between Christmas and New Year's, and we did that again this year. Uh, Rhonda's parents and her brother and wife were up uh, right before Christmas and spent time with us, and then our girls were here for our Christmas Eve service. If you weren't here Christmas Eve, you missed a very nice service, but they were here, they spent the night and were with us Christmas Day, and they brought their new puppies along, so that was uh, quite an experience. Uh, our dogs didn't uh, really take too well to their puppies, but that's another story. But we had a wonderful, relaxing week, and often we'll go to Pennsylvania to visit my side of the family, but we just stayed in town and uh, used a couple gift cards to go out to some nice restaurants. So we had a great week. I hope you did too. But one of the things that we always want to remember at Christmas is that there are those who struggle at Christmas. Many people feel very alone at Christmas. Many people face major crisis events at Christmas. And sometimes uh, it's just unfortunate things like sickness. I was talking to somebody last week who was t told me that they had their vacation all planned at Christmas, and then a day or two before their vacation, they got sick and spent a lot of their vacation sick. Uh, we've had times like that where we had a major sickness at Christmas time and uh, plans get changed and trips that you have get canceled. But uh, when we think about the first Christmas, the birth of Christ, there was great joy with the birth of Christ, but it was a time of great sadness too. And uh, let me say that I'm going to jump from thought to thought to thought today. Don't say afterwards, boy, Pastor Dean was sure scatterbrained today. It's intentional. I'm intentionally scatterbrained. Uh, but we're going to get to where we want to go. So at the first Christmas, uh, it is a time of great joy, but it's also a time of great sadness. Uh, this weekend was a holiday that we often ignore. We talked about it in Sunday school today called Epiphany. Epiphany Sunday, which uh, we're not exactly sure what it represents, but the, the most common idea is that it represents the visit of the wise men who came and visited Jesus, not in the manger when he's born, but later on at the house Days, weeks, months, even years later, we're not sure how long it was after his birth, but uh, January 6th is Epiphany. December 25th to January 6th, 12 days, the 12 days of Christmas. We all know the song, but we don't know where they come up with the 12 days of Christmas. Well, they celebrate from Christmas Day until Epiphany. Some countries, Epiphany is actually a bigger holiday than Christmas Day itself. So the Magi come, and they worship the newborn king. They offer him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They've been guided by God on their journey, and they are given angelic warning to keep them safe on their way home. So it, it is a great time for them. But we often jump over what comes next in the text. Rachel weeping for her children. Herod finds out about this newborn king of the Jews. And so he slaughters all the male babies and toddlers two years old and under. And you can imagine the grief of the mothers and fathers of those children. So we often celebrate Bethlehem as a birthplace, but is also a place of death. Mixed with the joy of the birth of Christ is the grief and sadness at the death of these precious children. And that's one of the paradoxes that we live with every day. As Christians, we live daily with our sins forgiven, a joy for living, a home in heaven, 
all these things that are ours as Christians. But we live in this world of sin and sickness and sadness and death. And it is at times like that that we need to remember we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Our hope is not in what this world has to offer us. Our hope is not that life goes well all our days. Our hope is in living well all our days, living in such a way that when our Savior returns, we'll be able to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because that is our hope, not the birth of Christ, but the return of Christ. And we see that all through the scriptures. That's what we're going to see here today in Titus 2. Uh, if you found that passage, we're going to start reading at verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. So what do we teach? What is our hope? What should we focus on and look forward to? The return of Jesus Christ. Remember the night before he died. That was the message that Jesus gave to his disciples. He says in John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. That was the message that the disciples were given after the resurrection when Jesus ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, the angels say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The return of Christ is the message we see in the book of Revelation as well. Revelation 22, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So this great truth, the return of Christ, is all throughout the Scriptures. And we know the truth, we believe the truth, but sometimes we forget to embrace the truth, to look for the return of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus surely will return. He has given us his word, he has told it to us, and we can rely on that. Now, often with our American mindset, we like to focus on dates and times. We talk about the return of Christ and Often people say, well, is he coming before the tribulation or after the tribulation? Some people even go so far as to try to pinpoint a year or a month or a certain date. Uh, there have been people who set dates and then Jesus didn't return and say, well, I was off a month, it's going to be next month, and then they keep on changing the dates. But what is so much more important than trying to pin down a date is focusing on the fact on the truth of the return of Jesus. And we should be looking for his return. Peter writes about this in his second letter, 2 Peter 3. He reminds us that scoffers will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. 
And Peter goes on in that passage to explain to us, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So our Lord is returning. That is our hope. And the delay in his return is not because he's having problems, not because he's slow, not because he's forgotten about it. It's because of his love for the people of the world. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So we should live with expectancy. As we start this new year, I would encourage you to live expecting the return of Jesus Christ. It will change the way we live. So in light of the return of Christ, how do we live while we wait for his return? And we see that here in Titus as well. Paul is writing to Titus, a young man he had mentored, and he leaves him on the island of Crete. And uh, Paul says, those Cretans, they are a nation of liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. They said it about themselves. But the Christians on the island of Crete were supposed to live differently than everyone else. They were supposed to stand out. They were supposed to shine. And uh, in chapter 2, if you look at verse 10, Paul reminds us that as we live, we should make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. The sad thing is that there are so many Christians who instead of making the teaching about Christ attractive, they turn people off by the way they live their life, by the things they say, by the things they do. We have a great message of God's free forgiveness for us. And yet, so many times, because of the way we live our lives, we turn others off to the truth. I was talking to someone this week who was sharing with me about growing up in a church here in town and about all the hurt and pain he experienced in that church from those even in his own family who were abusive toward him. So how should we live in 2.13? It tells us that the return of Christ is a blessed hope. And it is. We know that one day Jesus will come and set everything right. One day Christ will return to reward us for faithfulness. To know that one day Christ will return to make us enjoy his presence forevermore. That is a blessed hope. But while we wait, verse 12 tells us, we say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it also says we live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This is part of what makes us different from the rest of the world. While everyone else is saying yes to all their passions and desires and anything they want to do, as Christians, we say no. We say, I am going to obey God and not indulge myself. We choose to be self-controlled. We choose to live a godly life of restraint. And most Christians tend to do well in this area because we know clearly where those lines are and the things we shouldn't be doing. And yes, we all stumble and fall. We all make mistakes. We all have times where we end up doing the things we know we shouldn't be doing. But we try our best to eliminate sinful actions from our lives. But there's a second part that we often miss. Whenever we take off certain things, we need to put on certain things as well. And Colossians talks about taking off all the things of the flesh and putting on all the righteous, godly attitudes that we should have. So here in Titus 2, verse 14, Paul writes and says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do 
what is good. So take a moment and think about yourself. Are you eager to do good? Reality of most of, is that most of us are willing to do good. If there was an accident in the parking lot and I walked out there and I crushed my leg, somebody drove over my leg and I'm screaming out in pain, I said, would you call 911 for me? I'm sure any one of you here would do that. We're, we're willing to help when there's a need. Many people will help when they're asked. If I called you up and said, I need a little help or I need somebody to talk to, can I meet you for coffee and just, just share my heart with you a little bit? Most of us would say, well, sure, I'll meet with you. Uh, most of us would help when asked. But that's not the idea Paul is presenting here. He writes that God's desire is to create a people who are eager to do good. The King James Version has the word zealous, which is uh, basically a close match to the Greek word zelotes, which is, uh, uh, so basically it's a transliteration of the Greek word. Uh, it's where we get the word zealot from, a zealot, somebody who is, uh, we might use in our day today, fanatical or obsessed the meaning is someone who is on fire, who is burning with passion. Someone who is all fired up. So the question is, are we all fired up, burning with passion to do good? Most of us say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do good now and then. But are we so on fire and passionate to do good? Now, when we talk about doing good, let's understand we're not just talking about doing good for our family and friends. Matthew 5, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? In Jesus' day, the tax collectors were corrupt. They would take four or five times what Rome demanded in taxes from people, and they'd keep the rest for themselves. Think about a, a mafia godfather. Even a mafia godfather can be kind and loving toward their children. So Jesus said even the corrupt tax collectors are nice to their family and friends. President Ronald Reagan was famous for the saying, the scariest nine words are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, the reality is IRS agents aren't known for being helpful. And so much less in Jesus' day. But Jesus says even corrupt tax collectors can be kind and do good to the ones they love. But instead, when we think about doing good, we need to go beyond just family and friends and relatives and neighbors. We need to seek to do good towards everyone. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So I know it says there in the end, we want to especially be good to the Christians. I agree with that. But let's not miss the first part. We want to do good to all people, even to those who aren't very lovely, even to the neighbor who goes out and cuts down your favorite tree, even though it's clearly on your side of the property line, even to the boss who comes in Friday afternoon and piles on a lot of work and says, you need to have this done by Monday morning, even to the relative who at the family gatherings is always criticizing you and cutting you down and mocking you and insulting you. We seek to go do good to all people. Yes, it's easy to do good to those we love, but so much harder to do good to all people. So, Christ has redeemed us so that we'll take off all those sin sinful actions but so we also put on this quality of doing good, 
doing good for all people. So what does it look like to do good? Titus uh, explains a little bit more for us about what it looks like for doing good. But Paul starts out in writing to Titus about some things we don't normally think about. First thing he leads on to is be good citizens. Chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one. So consider the, the context that Paul's writing to Timothy or Titus on the island of Crete. And this is an island filled with angry, corrupt pagans. Their lives are so debased that they're insulted even by their own countrymen. And the Romans had overthrown this island. And you can be sure that the Cretans did not like being controlled by Rome. But instead of venting all their anger against Rome and Caesar and all the soldiers, Christians are reminded that they are supposed to be subject to these Roman rulers and authorities. Why? Because God teaches us that obedience to government authorities is a way of honoring God. Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 1, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So when we think about being a people who are eager to do good, Paul leads right into this idea. But if you're going to do good, be a good citizen. It's not what we'd expect him to start out with. And in verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul says, remind the people. This is a word that in the, is literally in the uh, uh, a tense that refers to continuing action. Keep on reminding the people. Because the truth is that the Christians at Crete knew what they were supposed to do, but they needed to be reminded of it. And in the same way, so often we know the things we ought to be doing, we just need to be reminded to keep on doing the things that we know are right. Paul continues on to verse 2 of chapter 3, and he says, To slander no one. How often have you heard Christians making all kinds of slander statements, insults, innuendos, name-calling of public officials, whether it be the president or the vice president or candidates in an election or even on a local level, your local mayor or city council members? It is so easy when you disagree with someone to call them names to make snide, insulting remarks about them. Now, I'm not saying you can't disagree with a position a person takes, but make sure you do it honestly and respectfully. Don't misrepresent the person in their views. Don't insult them by making derogatory, mocking remarks about them. That's also part of being a good citizen. And understand, I'm talking about all political parties, uh, whether it be Joe Biden or Donald Trump or any of the other candidates, uh, or like I say, on local levels as well. You might disagree with someone, but don't slander them, don't insult them. Deal with issues, yes. Deal with truth, yes. But don't make personal attacks toward them. So, when we think about doing good, the first thing Paul leads Titus into seeing is that we should be good citizens. Then he also goes on to say that we want to be a good neighbor. And as he goes through this list here in chapter 3, he switches from being a good citizen to being a good neighbor. He finishes up saying, be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility toward all men. And so he gets on to talking about being a good neighbor, a good co-worker, a good friend. He uses this term, be peaceable. 
which doesn't mean don't blow up in anger. A lot of times we read that and say, well, okay, well, I'm good, doing good. I haven't lost my temper recently. But it could be translated as having a sweet reasonableness. When possible, give in to others. Don't be someone who always has to have your own way. Sometimes we think that being a Christian means that we, whatever I say goes, and I, my way is best, and I know best. Paul says we should have a true humility, which is not the idea of having true humility versus false humility, but literally it says having all humility, having the greatest possible humility. We can each show a little humility at times, but Paul takes it to the extreme. Show the greatest humility possible. And before we say, well, I can't do that, let's remember our example, Jesus, Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the God of all creation, the one who spoke the worlds into being, the one who the winds and the waves obeyed, humbles himself and becomes a servant to all. How much more should we, who are nothing, serve one another? So we see what good works is all about, being a good citizen, being a good neighbor, being a good friend. But why should we do good? Paul goes on to give Titus another reminder here. He goes on in chapter 3 and reminds us who we were. He goes through a list of what our lives were like before grace changed us. He's saying, Titus, we were just like those Cretans. We were just like them, but God changed us. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes to the church at Corinth and tells them, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It goes on to say, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When we think about doing good for others, Part of the motivation we have is realizing all that God has done for us. God has changed us from what we used to be like to something new. And because of that, we should be constantly looking to do good to others in hopes that they also can have their lives transformed. Will doing good to others save them? No, it won't. But will it lead them to want to hear more from us about the gospel that can save them? Yes, it will. So, it will make the teaching of Christ attractive when we do good to others. So we do good because we remember who we were. We also do good because of who we are. We are uniquely prepared by God to do good to others so that they will be drawn to God. Matthew 5, 16, I love this verse. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. When we do good to others, it points them to Christ. It points them to our Heavenly Father. And they are driven to give praise to God because of the good they see us doing. We don't take the credit. We don't take the glory. The glory goes to God. Peter writes about that in 1 Peter 2. And he says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Again, that same idea there. When we do good, it points others to our God. God has uniquely created us to do good. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's workmanship his poem his masterpiece is literally what that word means 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God has changed us by his grace to be a beautiful masterpiece. And our job now is to do good works. It's who we are. It's what we are to be about. It is good to come to church on Sunday and worship God. We should do that, but we're going to be worshiping God for all eternity. But we only have the few years we live on this earth to do good towards others in hopes of seeing them come to faith in Christ as well. Galatians 6, 9 encourages us, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Sometimes we give up on others far too quickly. We say, oh, it's no re use in reaching so-and-so. I tried that before, and I didn't see any results. Don't give up. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So let's remember that doing good works is not just something we do. It's who we are. It's what we're, we were created for. In uh, Titus 3, 8, Paul continues on and says, I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. King James Version says to maintain good works. Literally, the meaning is to take the lead in doing good. When we know of a need, Christians should rise up and come alongside others and help with that need. Sadly, many non-Christians do a far better job of coming alongside others when they see a need. As Christians, we need to do a better job of coming alongside and taking the lead in doing good. So why do we do good works? We remember who we were. We remember who we are. So how do we prepare ourselves to do good works? And here are just a couple practical ideas. If you want to be ready to help and do good, it means that you might need to make some changes in your life. First thing is to clear your schedule. Not completely, but we need margin in our lives. Sometimes we are so busy that we couldn't attend our own funeral for three weeks. Uh, sometimes our, our, our calendars are full up and we don't have time for anyone else. Somebody stops by or calls us up and say, hey, can, can I talk with you? You say, not now, I'm on my way here and uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to call you this week. We need margin. Say, well, what if I put some margin and not, nobody has a need? We can always fill up our time. But it's hard to find time if we don't plan some margin in our lives. Secondly, set aside some money that's available to help others who have a need. It would great, be great if we could just help others by just praying for them, say, well, fine, I'll pray for you. But many times, the needs of others need money to meet that need. And if we want to be ready to help, we need to have some money available. I don't mean take your tithe money and give it to somebody else. God says that the first portion of what he's blessed us with is to be brought into the storehouse, bring it to the house of God. But beyond that, we take out of the, the other 90% money to help others. Say, well, that's my money. No, it's not. It all belongs to God. We're just stewards. He just lets us use it. And God tells us he wants us to work so that we will have money to help others. Ephesians 4, 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. So God wants us to work so that when there is a need, we'll have some resources to help others. Say, well, I can't help everybody. 
No, but we can all help somebody. And that leads to the next thing, which is pray and listen. Many times we look right past the needs of others because we're so focused on ourselves. Sometimes uh, people will call up and ask about helping with the need and sometimes they say no or no, we don't have anything for that. Other times God's Spirit says yes, help that one. And we always need to be sensitive enough to listen to the Spirit of God. We can't help everyone, but we can all help someone. And when the Holy Spirit prompts us and says, why don't you check in with Mary this week? Do it. Listen when God's Spirit leads you and prompts you and lays someone on your heart. And then one of the greatest ways we have of preparing to do goods is interaction with other Christians. Hebrews 10.23 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. A spur. That little wheel on the boot of the cowboy's boot that he kicks into the backside of the horse and it brings forward movement. Do you remember as a kid sitting in geometry class and you've got your sharp pencil and the kid in front of you has their backside sticking out of the chair? Pencil, backside. And suddenly you think about poking them with that pencil? I'm not advocating that or recommending it, but that poking, that spurring brings on movement. One day uh, in Rhonda's second grade class years ago, there's a boy named David, and he came up and said, Mrs. Ryan, Ryan poked me with a pencil, and that wasn't on my agenda for the day. <laughs> Many times, doing good to others is nowhere on our agenda. Oh, we have all our plans of what we're going to do, but we often fail to think about how we can do good to others. And so we need motivation, but we need to motivate others to action. The, the uh, idea is not that we motivate ourselves, but that we come alongside others and motivate others to do good. Many times we think about, what can I do as an individual? But the truth is, what we can do as a group is so much greater. We are stronger together than the sum of our individual strengths. And together we can accomplish more than we can individually. Satan knows us, and he often tries us, get us to act on ourselves. Well, I don't need anybody else. I can do this myself, and, and I don't need to ask anybody for help. And then we end up frustrated and feeling like a failure. But the truth is that God has created us to live and to serve and to work together in harmony, in unity, as a body. So God has uniquely created us to do good deeds. One final question. Will you? Will you? Will you be fired up on passion to do good to others so that God receives the glory? Let's pray together. Father, it's wonderful to know not only did you save us, but you have made us a masterpiece. You made us to be a masterpiece so that we can do good to others and they will be drawn to give you all the praise. Help us, Lord, to live this week in expectancy, in expectancy of your return and in expectancy of opportunities to do good. And help us, Lord, to motivate one another, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, on Christmas Eve at the service, Rick and Sharon and Ron and I sang this song as a quartet because we need to have peace on this earth. And so I think for this first Sunday of the very new year, we need to sing it again. So will you stand and join us? Peace that was meant to be with God.
remind us that Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Seek to bring peace in your world this week. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.